Welcome everybody for our weekly seminar series, one before the end, thanks God. And today we are very happy to host Dr. Daniel Falcon, that I know for many, many, many years. Um, a short bio. Um, Daniel has a master and a PhD degree from in geology from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem under the supervision of uh, Motishtan and Miguel Erel. The main focus was the pilot plan for construction from uh, that forward in sediment course from the Gulf of Aqaba, the Red Sea, and the Dead Sea. <clears throat> and he was a participant of the ICDP DSDP project in the Dead Sea. And the tools that he used um, are the major that he's still using are major and trade sediment geochemistry as well as the systems to decipher provenance of the sediments. His first postdoc was at the IUI in the last school, Professor Adi Tolstein, where he learned new types uh, of systems, the laboratorium, and the constructing mass accumulation rates in the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden. <clears throat> a second postdoc uh, that was uh, funded by Chateaubriand Fellowship in France, conducted in Paris in IPGP with uh, Catherine Chauvel. Studying the influence of dust on current ecological system as carriers of fresh nutrients. After a few years of geological consulting, now a member of the civil engineering department in Nadia University. So, with these words, we are very happy to host you, and the podium is yours. Thank you very much, Nicolas. Indeed, the, Nicolas had said, we heard it uh, in the short uh, bio that. Uh, that is something that I've uh, been dealing with for a long time. Uh, in my second postdoc, I began to look at dust and what well, in the master's and PhD, I did what's happening with the paleo dust and what we can learn from it. And ever since my second postdoc, I'm looking at how the dust influences current <clears throat> ecological uh, systems. Like what's, what's our interaction with the dust? And this work today that I'm going to present you is how the dust is affecting the nutrients or the ion nodes that we show that it is called in the plants that are living. Dust resting on the leaves may have an important. So, uh, this work has been done in conjunction with uh, Dr. Van Erel from uh, Vulcani Institute. He's dealing with he's in agriculture. Uh, he's dealing in agriculture. And uh, Dr. Avner Gross from Ben Gurion University and their students, Anton and Nathan Golan. And this work summarizes a lot of the insights that we got from Anton's PhD work. So, let's go into the details. When we apply dust, when we're thinking about the conjunction of dust and plants, we think bad stuff. We might have read about the dust bowl period in central central USA, where there was an intense period where a lot of dust had covered many, many crops in the US and caused serious problems with them. And why is it occurring? First of all, because the dust when it sits on the plant, it's blocking the stomata. So it reduces some interaction between the plant and the environment, such as respiration and also photosynthesis. So it cannot, it cannot grow. Photosynthesis is the process where plants are growing. Also, we see that the plants that are affected by dust, they exerb, they exerb stress symptoms. It means they feel bad about it, they, as if there's, they're attacked by some uh, pest infection. And the dust may also be a vector of some heavy metals or something that is uh, toxic for the plant. But we know also that there could be um, upside of uh, dust interaction with plants. For example, in marine environments, a work by uh, Dr. Otal Ben Altabet that has done it in a lot. <clears throat> he did a very meticulous geochemical work 
looking at the water column and how it interacts with dust storms that are coming and what is the concentrations of what is the change in the concentrations of the chemical elements within the water column after the dust has occurred. Okay. This is a very hard work to do because you have to concentrate a lot of seawater and the sensitivity of your measurements is very low. So you have to be very, very good at what you do. And this is what he did. And he managed to find that there is interaction in the dust releases some of its metal elements that are contained in the minerals or in some places on the lattice of the mineral. And it's releasing it to the ocean. And it's, it's great. This is known also before Tyler did it. He just measured it in high uh, capabilities in the lab. But also before that, also before that, the iron hypothesis, you may have heard about it by Martin in the late 90s. He said that iron supply to the oceans can increase the activity of the algae. For example, around Antarctica, this is what we see here. We see a picture around Antarctica, and you see that the, the waters around the Arctic waters, Antarctic waters, are very, very depleted in iron. The, low, the blue colors show that they don't have a lot of iron in it. But there is a correlation between dust storms. This is what we see here in the red line and the decreases in the CO2. If we're looking at the long period, that was 130,000 years ago. So we see a correlation between increases in dust. And we know that there are increases in dust because we've been measuring. So we can look at the ice cores and we see periods of the increase of dust flux. And we see that the CO2 is going down. And the mechanism is because there is more chlorophyll. Okay, More chlorophyll is more plant, more algae going, growing there. And this is the experiment uh, done in the lab. One flux without iron and algae, the other flux with iron and algae. And we see increase in the algae content, which means that the algae take the iron from the dust and they grow. So there is like a benefit of the in introducing dust to plants. Uh, but this for a marine plant, you can also look at it in terrestrial plants. What could be the benefit of dust to terrestrial plants? So we're looking at, we're looking at the chlorophyll molecule. And in the midst of the chlorophyll molecule, there is one ion magnesium. Where could the magnesium come from? So we're looking at uh, the composition of dust storms that they uh, bring in all, all sorts of elements to the region. And we see that there are certain dust storms, for example, the RSC, it's the Red Sea Trap, it's a storm that coming to Israel from the east and they are enriched in magnesium. So they provide the magnesium to the soils of Israel from which the plants then take this ion, the magnesium, and they incorporate it into the chlorophyll molecule. And then they use it. So the sources of the dust, as I showed, there is the sources that come from the east, but the main sources of dust to Israel are coming from northern Africa. This was shown in 73, and then 45 years later, I re-showed it. I, I showed again what they know, only I used a different method. I used isotopic signature, and when I'm talking about isotopic signature of material, it means that I can fingerprint it. I actually know where the material has come from. And I'm using two systems here. For example, uh, the epsilon neodymium. This the neodymium is one element, and strontium is another element. And I'm looking at the isotopic composition of this isotopic system in the material, and I see that I can uh, identify that most of the dust is coming. Indeed, like they showed it 50 years before me without so much uh, fancy techniques. Most of the dust is coming from the Sahara. Okay, so what I'm actually want to show you here in the purpose of our, our uh, conversation today is that I can use these systems to know where the dust is coming from. And this ability was then, uh, was done in the mountain ecosystem in Northern America. Well, they sampled the, the nodinum, they sampled various samples that were from pine needles and dust. And they, they measured the nodinum value. And they showed that the nodinum value of the bedrock is minus nine. 
this is the fingerprint of the devil. And the redeeming value of that is closer to minus is around minus five. And when you look at the pine needles in the soil, you see the resemblance between them. Well, there is some kind of a mix between them. Yeah, not everything is the same value. There is some kind of a mix. It's more resembling the dust value, which means that the dust provides the neodymium, and not only the neodymium, also other nutrients to the needles. So we're thinking, we're looking at the forest somewhere in the mountains, and we're saying that, okay, uh, where, where does it take its uh, mineral, minerals from? The soil. Where is the soil coming from? From the rock. No, it's coming from the dust. Okay? The soil, the mineral composition of the soil is coming at least in northern uh, USA and also in uh, Israel. The mineral composition of the soil is coming from dust. Which brings us to the next question. How could it affect maybe through the foliage? And this is a preliminary experiment that Rani Rell did. He just took some lettuces and he thought he's, he's uh, an expert in plant nutrition. He always looked at the roots. This time he tried, maybe I will spray some dust on the, on the samples and I'll see what's going on. And he grew some lettuces without dust on the samples and one line and some lettuces with the low dust and high dust. And you see immediately that there is effect. All the plants got the same nutrition, but the, those one on the left, they got a lot of the more dust on the foliage and they grew larger, which this preliminary result got the funding and they managed to do more uh, detailed work. And they looked at several plant types and they show that the, also the phosphorus content and also the biomass of plants that are treated with dust is increasing. How do we see it? The minus B, minus B means that the plant was fertigated, it was added with nutrient solution without phosphorus. Okay? So these plants got the, the red plants, they got nutrient solution without phosphorus, and the orange plants got nutrient solution without phosphorus and dust on the leaves, and we see the increases, which are statistically significantly higher, and you see it in the picture, this is with dust, but well, it's bigger, it's larger, right? This works, it's actually working. Yeah, the plants that we apply dust on actually can update the nutrients from the dust through only the foliage. Now, why could it be important for us? Because we know we're facing climate change, and we're not talking about the reason why the CO2 is increasing in the atmosphere, although it's a consensus that it's due to human activity. We're looking at the composition of the plants. We see here all the blue bars, when they're compared to plants that are growing under normal conditions, and if they're grown under elevated condition of CO2. We see that all the mineral nutrients Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, and everything, and totally all together the ion, which is the composition of all its mineral nutrients in the plant, is decreasing. So plants under elevated CO2 conditions, they show a depletion in their ion. Yeah, all these mineral nutrients, which we also need for our health. On the other hand, the carbon is rising up. Why is that? There are two reasons for this, okay? In this situation, this is a very, very bad situation for us. Think about it, elevated CO2 conditions, it's occurring. We're living in uh, increasing CO2 conditions and the plants that we're eating are getting less and less nutritious for us, okay? Why is it occurring? Two reasons. The first is dilution. Think about a plant that is doing photosynthesis, it's a accumulating carbon into its uh, body. And if we're increasing the CO2 conditions that are, it's going into, it's absorbing more carbon. Yeah, it's taking more carbon into its body, but it does not compensate with the necessary mineral nutrients. So there is a dilution. The same amount of mineral nutrients in the plant is uh, supporting a bigger body. This is like, uh, junk food, basically. Like when you're eating junk food, you're eating more carbs, but less nutrients. This is the first 
the mechanism that causes this depletion that I showed you, the other mechanism that, that under elevated CO2 conditions, for some reason, we're not going to go too much into depth with it. The roots are not as effective. The roots are less, are taking less nutrients and sort of spreading it into the plant. So there are two mechanisms that causing a total overall depletion in the ion arm of the plants when uh, under elevated conditions of uh, CO2. So what are my research questions when uh, referring to foliar nutrient uptake? First, I want to ask what mineral nutrients are they get being taken? Uh, can you quantify this? Yes, you can. I'll show you how. What is the mechanism? How the plant does actually absorb the nutrients or uptake the nutrients to the foliage? Uh, how does this mechanism act under elevated CO2? And maybe finally I will get to the question about what's the broader impact or why is it interesting as, uh, for us to ask these questions? So let's go into the experimental setting. We grew the plants under two conditions. One was the ambient condition of CO2, which is as of today, 14, 412, it's a little bit higher now. And we're under, also under elevated CO2 conditions. We did extreme. And we did, uh, as, uh, as the world will look in 50 years, if we're doing uh, business as usual, pumping more and more CO2 into the atmosphere, and we applied the dust either only on the foliage, we cover the, the pots, so the dust will not go into the roots, and we also did an, uh, a parallel experiment where we applied the dust only into the pots and not on the foliage to see if uh, one is more important than the other. We used three types of dust, the desert dust, volcanic ash, and fire ash. These are the main uh, dust particles that are occurring on Earth. And we had overall together six repetition of each type. So six repetition of the root application of desert dust, and then six uh, root application of volcanic ash, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we also grew cont control group. They, they got the same application, but no dust on them. So this is how we can compare if the dust is actually affecting. We did it, as I said, in both ambient and elevated conditions of CO2. What are the results? Uh, we see on the left, on both the uh, rooms, okay, this is 412, this is 18, 8, 850 ppm of CO2. On the left, we see the root treatment, on the right, we see the foliar treatment, in both the treatments, and we see that the root treatment is not increasing, not the phosphorus constant, phosphorus content, and not the biomass, also here. There is a little bit of the rise here in the volcanic ash, but basically the root treatment does not affect over short time scales. It took them, these plants to grow about three to four weeks, then we harvested them and we measured their uh, biogeochemical uh, properties. And we see that the root treatment is not affecting, only the foliar treatment is affecting over short time scales. So over short time scales, we see that also in the 412 and also in the future, CO2 conditions, there is increase. The red blocks are the control. Okay? These are the ones that they didn't get any dust on them. And this is the, the desert dust, and this is the volcanic ash. So we see increases. When we apply dust on the foliar, we see increases in the biomass and in the phosphorus content kind of repeating what I showed you before of the work of Gross et al. But here we did it also with volcanic ash, so this is a little bit novel. It's nice. How does the plant actually do it? How do they activate? How do they take the nutrients from the, from the minerals? So we measured various plant properties, for example, what is the profile of the acidic, the organic acids that uh, it exerts out on its leaf? The, the leaves are, are a little bit uh, more acidic. And we see that the, the, the not the purple, sorry, the pink, the pink bars are some variety of plant that is natural. And the yellow bars is some variety of plant that is cultivated. 
we chose this cultivated plant because we saw uh, a good reaction to foliar application to that. And we see that the cultivated brand, the habit, it's its name, it's chickpea, hummus, and it has a higher concentration of various organic acids on the plant leaves. Okay, this is taken from the plant leaf. We straight it up and we characterize what acids are going there. We see there are more acids on various, uh, in very, uh, on all the organic acids that is exerting out, which finally comes, uh, it accounts for the lower pH. Lower pH is more acidic for the zehavit, for the cultivated, rather than the natural brand of the hummus. And how does it do it? It's growing more trichomes, a little health that we have on the, on the plant leaf. And when we have more trichomes, they can push out more acids, these acids, and they lower altogether the pH of the of the plant surface, and thus they can dissolve or dislocate some mineral nutrients from the soil phase, from the minerals, into the plant. And all the leaf, it goes into the rest of the plant, to the rest of the shoot. For quantification, we use the minimum isotopes. Cause, uh, as I showed you, I can fingerprint where it's coming from, and I can also do a quantification because I know how much of the minimum based on its down is coming from where, whether it came from the from the nutrition solution or, or whether it came from the from the dust that I applied on the foliage, and what we see here is a summary of that. We see here the control group that didn't get it's fine. Okay. So uh, I'm sorry. The control group has an aluminum, and the neodymium is not coming from the dust because because it didn't get any dust, so it has some inheritance value from the seed, and it's receiving some. Neodymium from the fertigation solution, from what they supply with the nutrition solution for the plant. And we have on the left side the volcanic ash that I applied, and the neodymium value of the volcanic ash is five. And we have on the right side the neodymium value of the desert dust, which is minus 10. And then I'm doing a mixing equation. I can actually quantify, calculate how much of the dust is coming either from the source like the control group that has no additional uh, input of neodymium, and how much is coming from the dust that I apply. And I do it in two different equations. Here it looks like I did it on one, but it's not. I did it separately between volcanic ash and control and between desert dust and control. And we see that up to, yeah, this is the maximum value, 80% of the neodymium in the plants can come from the foliar uh, application, can come from foliar application. So this is the, the quantification. We need more samples to be, to have a more robust uh, understanding, but basically a preliminary result shows that up to 80% of the nutrition of the plant can come from the foliage. This might come here and to this audience and something that, okay, this guy is talking or whatever, but think about it. If you think about it, where do the plants get their nutrition from? From the roots. But what we're showing here for the first time is that plants can also take a significant, what is a significant? Up to 80% of its nutrients are coming from the foliage. This is maybe a new way to fertilize our plants. And uh, so, how much time do I have in class? Okay. okay. So, first the uh, round of conclusions. Uh, is that over the short time scales, only the, the foliage pathway is significant for the plants. So if we have plants that is dusted, it absorbs the nutrients from the, from the, from the dust to the foliage. And over the short time scales, it's more significant than the roots. We saw how we did it, the adaptations of the tritones, and we quantify it using the isotopic comp uh, composition of neodymium. 
Now I want to go into a more interesting part of the world in my in my eyes at least. Yeah. So we we show I showed you a comparison here between the volcanic ash and the desert dust, how it acts under uh, ambient conditions and under elevated conditions of the CO2, but we can't really say something significant about it. Really. We see that overall the process is working in both uh, occasions, and we see that overall uh, volcanic ash maybe is a little bit uh, more uh, contributing, but uh, also the desert dust contributes a lot. But I wanted to look deeper into the processes of what's happening here. And this is where the chemistry of the geo geochemistry is coming into power a lot, I think, in this research, is that when you're looking at the trace element composition of the plants, okay, looking specifically at the layered elements, the, this uh, line value starts with lantan, so we call, call the lantanids. Here there are among all the elements that uh, comprise our solar system. And overall, this group of elements, because of some resemblance in their atomic structure, they act chemically the same, right? Chemically, they act the same, so they will have the same interaction with their environment, but they have some variance or some very, very minute fractionation due to specific processes. If it's occurring, if it's not occurring, then there is no. But so looking at the lanthanides, this is the row of the lanthanides. We see here in the grays uh, the composition of the dust, the various dust that we apply to the plants volcanic ash, desert dust, and uh, fire ash. And it correlates to the right uh, axis, to the right y axis, and all the various plants. That we're looking at, which correlates to the left uh, y axis. Basically, we see that the right y axis is much higher. Yeah, this would be expected because minerals have very uh, a lot larger concentration of these rare elements in, in them when comparing to the plants. Okay, the plants are under hundreds and the trees are under hundred thousands. But we see that there is kind of a uh, it's called a spider diagram. You can see by its structure how it relates. Maybe it draws the composition from the source that we put on, right? the dust that we put on the polio. It's easy to read for a geochemist or a chemist, but it's more hard to see it when you're not from the field. So we did another analysis where I'm showing anomalies. Okay, there, there are sometimes anomalies. We can calculate anomalies. And if the anomalies between the material that I apply and the plant that I apply it on are similar, then I can uh, argue that they actually draw it from there. And we see a little bit vaguely the asterisks, the small stars, are the mineral material. So we have here the volcanic ash, and here are the dots of the desert dust. And here is the fire ash. And we see the various plants that are applied. Overall, it's not one on one, it's not the geological samples, this is biological samples, and there is a lot of variance in geological samples, as I learned through the years. But we see that all, overall, the plant samples lie next to the mineral samples, which is the proof that actually the plants absorb their rare elements from the dust that we applied on. And uh, we can, okay, this is the pattern. Something is missing, but whatever. We see that uh, basically the volcanic ash provides more rare earth elements than desert dust, and fire ash provides no rare earth elements to the plants. And that elevated CO2 has more con con contributing more nutrients to the plants than ambient CO2. So this process of foliar nutrient uptake will be more significant in the future when elevated the CO2 conditions will occur. And we were looking at the fractionation, how the fractionation, because I told you that these plants, they act the same, they, these elements act the same chemically to the world, but if there is some kind of fractionation because of a process, a specific process, it could tell us something about it. And the way that they show it here is by this Lalu ratio, the lantan, divided by mutation ratio, 
and the total plant uh, phosphorus or some kind of vitality of the plant uh, indicator. We see that the more, um, we can just emphasize this, that the fractionation process is that the plant is taking more of the light REE, which in time is the placenta, and less of the heavy REE, which is the lutetium. So when this ratio is increasing, I argue that the fractionation process is occurring more. And you see, of course, with the unexpected variance, that indeed this fractionation occurs in plants when, when we see that the, the higher land ratio corresponds to higher uh, plant vitality indicator. And there is a nice correlation between everything uh, going down. We have it in the paper that we also calculate what's the significance. It's significant. And what is the process behind this fractionation? This is one of our arguments. Uh, it's actually changing the chlorophyll molecule. We see here the chlorophyll molecule as it's supposed to. So regularly is, mostly is, or with the magnesium ion in the middle. But all these other structures are when we change the chlorophyll uh, molecule with other elements from the rarer group. Okay, so they have various uh, 3D compositions. Great, I don't understand much about it. But I do understand that it's changing the, the ability of the plant to perform photosynthesis by both uh, increasing the SORET uh, versus Q band ratio. And actually what it does, it allows the chlorophyll molecule, the different uh, structure of it, to act under different light conditions. Different meaning it can start working, the molecule can start working earlier in the morning and later into the evening under purple lights, okay? Under purple to blue lights, it will start working when the regular chlorophyll molecule with the magnesium will need higher activation energies that occurs only in, uh, in noon, for example. So when we change the chlorophyll molecule with the REE, it acts longer, and this is how it actually grows bigger, the plants. And we see it when we also do uh, measurements of the carbon assimilation photosynthesis of plants. We see that the total REE, when, when, when it's increasing in the plants, it's causing more uh, photosynthesis. Okay, carbon assimilation is a measure of the photosynthesis of the plant. And we see a positive correlation between the content of the REE and the carbon assimilation process. One minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is great news. It means that indeed, when we have more REE in the plants, when they absorb more, when they uptake more nutrients, or specifically REE, they create more photosynthesis in the plant and they grow larger. Over here, I show these are the dust samples and now the color samples of here are the control samples that we have. Of course, they will have more photosynthesis because they are not covered with dust and that affects the photosynthesis, blocks it, but they have a very low REE content. And just to prove that this measurement is valid and okay. Conclusion number two, uh, the REE as a geochemist or biogeochemist now, it's a great method to study underlying processes that are not seen in the major elements or even the isotopic systems. We saw the two trends. First of all, that the volcanic ash provides most of the REE into the plants when we compare it to the desert dust or the fire ash that contributes to nothing. And that uh, under elevated CO2, this process of foliar nutrient uptake occurs more. Possibly. Why should we care? So now I'm going into more medical world, medical realm. And the, we know about the iron deficiency in nature. This is something that uh, occurs more in children, in pregnant women, women and in elderly women. You simply have less iron, and then you, you drink this uh, iron solution to increase the iron. It's a problem also in Israel, but it's most uh, mostly felt in the sub-Sahara regions. 
where they don't have access to such uh, to this uh, staton, to this uh, solution, to increase the energy. And bear in mind that in the future, the iron content of the plant is going to decrease. So this problem of iron deficiency anemia, IDA, will increase in time. So what we did now, I did the same thing that is done here. I compared the plants that are grown under today's condition and what will happen in elevated conditions of CO2, and I do a, a ratio between them. And I see, for example, that if I apply foliar dust on the plant, the, let's go over it a little bit. The red circles are the control samples. So this one, the one that didn't get any dust. And you see mm -hmm. that under elevated conditions of uh, CO2, there is a depletion in the nutrients, in the ionome of the plant. But when, we, when I, we apply the dust, we see an increase in mainly in nickel, but more importantly, in the iron. So the foliar application of dust, of both desert dust and the volcanic, ash, the volcanic ash, also here we see a major increase in the volcanic ash, supplies more iron to the plants, which is great news for the, um, for the iron deficiency and the problem. So the take home message, this is the final uh, slide. Foliar nutrient uptake is a viable mechanism. It works, we showed it under uh, controlled uh, experiments. It needs to be incorporated into the nutrient cycle, the models that that are run around the world, how plants absorb nutrients, how they have nutrients, also foliar pathway is uh, great. We are the first group to comprehensively and publish about it. And what Leon is doing, cleaning up his uh, leaves, it's not such a great thing for us. So thank you. Questions. Thank you very much. Do you have questions? It's a one comment like small comment. So it's better to put more dust at fertilizer than what you mean like in the future. Like I'm right now <laughs> I'm right now writing a proposal about it because it's of course how much dust you put is important. If you put too much dust to block the possibility. So no, but together. There might be a sweet spot, like if you apply the right amount of dust. You also apply the fertilizer and you also apply the dust. By the way, foliar fertilization is being done today in the agriculture world, but they do it with sprays. They spray solutions that are enriched in a certain, like if a farmer looks at plants and sees, ah, I missed some magnesium. So he mixes magnesium into a solution and sprays it on its leaves. Great. There is a lot of problems in the plants when applying these solutions. Uh, causing uh, imbalances of nutrients. It's causing also uh, all sorts of saltation because it's kind of salt. The magnesium is not just you know, free magnesium, it's coming with salt. It's causing saltation problems to the plants. Uh, we will design, uh, we want to design uh, a fertilizer, a mineral fertilizer that will support. It's not coming to replace, it will support. And do you see like a uh, phenomena of like biomagnifications of these uh, elementals, like how fruit will bring like uh, leaves or fruits? Do you see things like of? We didn't uh, look into it yet. We just, uh, this is the first uh, stage of this uh, research. We did shoot and wood. We just <clears throat> harvested the shoot and we measured the whole shoot. Now we're going to look into this uh, fortification. Where, where exactly does the uh, nutrients go? Yes. Do you think this research is going to change or affect the greenhouse method of agriculture? Very interesting. I think, yes, I want to do like five, ten years from now, I would want to go into this uh, hydroponics, you know, that will involve uh, plants under in water that are enriched in solutions. So maybe there it could also increase the efficiency of the plant to put the nutrients into the edible parts. What is called fortification. Fortification is how do we put more nutrients into the edible parts of the plants? So we will look into it. Yes, I hope this is what I'm claiming. 
just want to understand one thing regarding your experiment. That whether you have measured this exchange of fractions in the dust. Is the what exchange of fraction? Exchange of fraction in the dust. Fractions of what? Uh, fractions of uh, metals, uh, yes, metals and yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we also measured the composition of the dust and also of the plants. Yeah. And then we compare between them and we saw and we show that actually the plant is receiving the metals that are present in the in the dust. I show it using the rare earth elements. Yeah, I don't know, you put the dust uh, you replenish the dust on the plant. I'm asking the dust which you have uh, four of the metals. You have uh, it, it was the bulk dust. And I'm asking that whether you have made the exchange in the dust because some of the elements, no. you know, they are the levine. No, no, no. Fraction. We did the bulk. We just ground it to be 163 yeah. microns and we applied it. Yeah. Yeah. Can I want to add something in Israel because of the plant usually after dust of storm we don't bring to wash it. It's interesting to look at the two phases immediately after the dust and then after the rain. Yeah. yeah, so for the first question, yes, we ran an experiment, it's already been harvested. Well, we went to a field uh, site. And we took native plants growing in uh, soils near Tsuradasa. And the problem in this research that you suggested is that the composition of the soil and the composition of the dust is identical because the soil is dust. This is what the Elon showed and finally Al showed. Soil in Israel is dust. So to do this, we took these plants and we applied volcanic ash on them. And then we closed it in this bag. You don't have a picture here, it's in a in a different presentation, but we did this experiment where we took three types of plants and we did control and we apply uh, some, some of the plants are controlled, some of the plants we apply volcanic ash and we need to run it. It's, we harvested it and now we need to run it for the lab. Actually, show that uh, the time is not working. Uh, most of the nutrients come from the dust. Yeah. Then, even if the soil and the dust are the same, you can, can still uh, maybe see something in two different phases. I might, but we wanted to do it more significant. This research, maybe it will be the next step of the student, because we wanted to show that indeed the nutrients are coming from the dust. Because if it's the same and we show, look, there is an increase, they will tell us ah, it's coming from the soil. Something happened in condition. The variance in uh, working with plants is huge. The samples that they showed you, the variance is huge. If I get R squared that is 0.4, I'm happy. And, but okay. So this is why we did it with volcanic ash that we took from uh, East time, I think, this time, and uh, we applied it on the on the plants, and we will see what the results are. Your next question is right. In Israel, most of the dust is coming in the winter. One, two days before a rainy, we will look at it. It will be maybe one of our uh, inspections of how indeed it reacts on a daily resolution to the dust storms. More questions? I have two, but I will ask you later. Okay. Thank I you. I have a question about the past and about the future. I can ask it now, actually. But, um... Some, I mean, I have a, a question I was thinking about the future, you know, but I don't know if it's a little bit a little stupid question. You know, these projects of conquering Mars and planting plants in Mars full of dust. Mm -hmm. so this will be the future. How do you cope with that part, right? But I don't know, because I don't know how you flow all that. I think this will be like a few said. Yes. Are you looking into um, 
farmhouses. So yeah. I don't know how it's going to be if we're going to do. And in the past, you know, I'm working with value. So we had the theories of the huge amount of that for the planet. Um rather the KP boundary probably so far in the past where the dust bowl, which was um the 20, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know, I was thinking on a question rather on that direction of the value of you. Can you use some kind of a proxy for paleo? I didn't find a way to do it yet. Uh, because in the paleo, we see the increases in the CO2, decreases in the CO2. Yeah. And we see the correlation to dust. When there is more dust, there is decrease in the CO2. This is the iron hypothesis. Yeah. It's a long presentation. Uh, yeah, so this is it. More dust supports more uh, algae, draws down the CO2. So it was there somehow, but in a sense of terrestrial plants uptake nutrients and enriching the, the nutrient balance in the plant, uh, we're the first. Maybe maybe a, a correlation with the pilot would be done, but no. But we need the plants material, we need the plant material. Yeah, no, I know. Yeah, and this is Let's talk about it. You need a market, I think. You need a market, actually. Okay, guys. Thanks uh, very much. <laughs> <laughs> and there is more pizza, don't you? Empty the box.